Thank you. Thank you. And with this, I'm handing the moderation over to Stu. Stu, you hey there. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everybody, with that, we are three minutes into the next session. Uh, so we'll just roll on ahead, uh, no break. Uh, this will be a 60 minute session, and Itamar Holder is our presenter. So I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me just right? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Can you all see it properly? Okay, that's great. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, Itamal Holder, and I'm uh, working for Red Hat as a software engineer. And in this lecture, I'll talk about live migration policies and uh, live migrations in general. I will have a general recap so that everyone uh, can understand why we need this and what's the motivation for it. Um, so, let's go. Um, so, this is the general agenda. I'll be talking about uh, what are live migrations? Um, why do we need them? Why are they important? <clears throat> um, how do they work in general? Um, and the challenges be behind uh, live migrations? How do we um, solve the challenges by certain configurations that we have at Kubernetes? Um, then I'll talk about the problems with the current way of configuring and tuning this, uh, the, those uh, migrations. Um, and finally, I'll get into the, the, the solution, which is uh, live migration policies. Um, I'll be talking about uh, policy hierarchies and deterministic matching and um, the, the current state and the future state of uh, live migration policies. Um, after all of that, we'll get to a short demo and then to the Q&A. Um, right, so um, let's begin. Um, so first of all, what are live migrations? Um, so basically, the migration part is moving a running VM from one node to another, or in other words, from one physical machine into another. Um, the live part of it um, stands for um, the fact that we're doing so without stopping the running workload, which means almost zero downtime. Um, now, um, we're not uh, supporting cold migrations in Kubernetes at all, which are non-live migrations. Um, basically, with non-live migrations, uh, there are uh, a lot of a lot of easier to implement um, because basically we're just stopping the workload, then performing the migration, and then continuing the workload. Um, this is this might be a problem in a distributed uh, environment with many moving parts that are all uh, dependent on one another. Uh, so we need something better, which is uh, almost zero downtime, and that's why all of our migrations are live migrations. Um, so basically, um, the, the, with live migrations, there are two things that are happening simultaneously. Uh, the first one is that we're transferring memory, storage, connectivity, and, and all, uh, everything that needs to be transferred from the source uh, physical machine to the target virtual machine. But um, at the same time, the workload keeps running. Therefore, it's changing the memory and storage and all of that. So, um, so uh, um, uh, okay. So, why are migrations uh, so important to us? So, basically, in um, regular Kubernetes environment, we're using uh, containers, not VMs. And uh, containers are designed to have uh, several characteristics. Um, first of all, they're small, um, they're ephemeral, which means that their state is um, uh, very, very small. Um, and basically, they're meant to be moved around easily, um, which also means they have very fast initialization time. So these are all um, uh, container characteristics and um, that every container, generally speaking, should have. Um, now, one of Kubernetes' most important design principles is to be Kubernetes native. Um, in other words, um, our goal is to have VMs and containers living seamless, seamlessly together on the same platform, which means that basically VMs need to uh, behave like containers um, in the same way. So, uh, but, but this is not, uh, not easy because VMs are very different from containers. Uh, they are harder to move around. Um, they do have significant state. Um, this state 
uh, can be uh, open files or uh, the state of the kernel or the state of um, uh, of the VM's hardware and and all and and, uh, and and among other stuff. So basically, it has a, a huge state comparing to a container, um, and it's not ephemeral. And uh, lastly, they're large, um, which means that the, their boot time is much bigger. It, um, uh, initialization time of containers, generally speaking, is a matter of seconds. And with VMs, it can easily become a matter of minutes. So um, this can bring many challenges. Um, so, but, but when are we uh, actually moving those uh, uh, VMs or containers around? So um, one example for that is uh, while draining a node. So uh, draining a node is basically moving around all the workload outside of the node so we can um, turn it off, update it, or whatever. Um, and basically disconnect it temporarily from the cluster. Um, so when we're speaking about containers, basically all of the containers are being moved out of the drain node. And that basically means uh, that we're deleting all of them and starting new instances in other places, um, which is a pretty easy task with containers. Um, so this is how it looks like. Uh, let's say you have node one and node two. So um, basically, we're deleting all of the containers in the first node and recreating them in a second node. Um, of course, with uh, in reality, it uh, it generally happens uh, uh, gradually. We can delete one container and then uh, create an instance elsewhere, and then delete another instance and, and make another instance elsewhere. Um, but eventually, this is what's happening: we're deleting the instances and basically simply creating them in another machine. Um, for the reasons we mentioned before, uh, this can be done naively with VMs. We can't just uh, delete a VM and start it elsewhere. It will take minutes to boot. It will uh, uh, lack the state of the previous instance, uh, and so on. Um, another example is upgrades. So um, this is done basically in the same way. Uh, if we're, if uh, in Kubernetes with regular containers, we want to upgrade uh, deployment, for example, then basically we are deleting an instance and recreating an instance with a higher version um, until all of the, the containers are removed and new containers uh, are created. And for the exact same reasons, this is uh, a problem with VMs. Um, so uh, more, more uh, examples uh, exist like load balancing and so on, but um, it's very reasonable to, to assume that uh, more uh, of these will will uh, will pop up in the future because basically that's how containers are by design. Again, they are moved. Uh, they are uh, designed to move, be moved around easily. Um, so uh, a lot of future stuff in uh, Kubernetes might use these characteristics, which are not going to be, uh, uh, which are going to stay with containers. Um, so um, to speak about migrations, uh, I'll present uh, a few kinds of migrations, and uh, we'll see wh what are they're good for and uh, and how to use them. Um, so basically, um, I'll, first of all, I'll show this, the three steps which are common to every migration that we're going to have. So um, first of all, the, the first step um, is to basically create another VM instance at the target node, uh, which is pretty similar to the, to the first step uh, we're doing with containers, simply uh, create them elsewhere. The second part, which is very different from regular uh, uh, containers, is that we have to move the state around from the first VM to the other one. Um, so in Qbert, we basically uh, establish a communication between two of those VM instances. And uh, where the, the state is being transferred from the source VM to the target VM. Um, and finally, again, like containers, we simply remove the, the source VM and let the, the target VM run. Um, so uh, this brings up um, a few challenges. So the fundamental challenge with uh, migration is that basically the memory keeps changing. Um, Eventually, the target needs to receive the up-to-date memory, and only then we can uh, stop the, the source VM and start running on the target VM, uh, which is called uh, a migration handoff in Qubit. Um, 
so um, one of the concerns is that, is that the the mem this whole uh, process will never converge, um, and this uh, and this can be caused by frequent writes to the memory. Um, but first, let's be optimistic and show the happy path. So this is uh, a pre-copy migration. Um, this is a, uh, the default migration, um, and basically, if nothing wrong happens, so uh, this migration should be uh, converted successfully. So what we're doing here is basically uh, we're uh, creating the target VM instance uh, on the target node, uh, and we're uh, running on the source VM. Um, and, and now what hap what's happening is that we're transferring all of the state to the target node. When the, tr when the state is transferred completely, and um, so we, we start the running on the target VM and delete the uh, source VM. And uh, this is all uh, great, but uh, again, with frequent writes, uh, migrations can be stuck. And um, uh, the main problem is that while uh, we transfer a memory block uh, from the source to the target, it can be um, mutated at the time we're transferring it. Uh, this means we have to copy the block again. Um, and the scenario can occur over and over, uh, causing migrations to hang, um, which is basically uh, a problem. So this is the illustration of it. So basically, if VM1 uh, frequently writes to the same um, memory block, um, we'll be moving it again and again and again. Um, if the, the, the writes are frequent enough, this will never end. Um, so one of the solutions we have to that is called autoconverge. And this is basically a technique for uh, overcoming uh, the, the scenario we I explained before. Um, and the, the idea is pretty simple. But basically, we throw the source VM CPU in a logarithmic uh, phase. And this means that at the beginning, the CPU will use all of this, uh, the, the VM will use all of the CPU. And uh, we will gradually throttle the, the CPU to uh, help the, the migration converge. So um, basically, the, first of all, uh, and just like uh, pre-copy migration, uh, the source VM is the one that is uh, running at the beginning. So uh, the source VM uh, starts running with 100% the uh, CPU. And over time, we decrease the CPU or throttle it. Um, to the point that it can um, converge and all of the uh, memory state is being transferred into the target. And then we uh, are running on the target, we can uh, remove the source VM and uh, the migration is done. Um, so it has uh, a pros and cons. So the pros is that um, basically convergence is guaranteed eventually. Um, if we throttle the CPU enough, we um, guarantee that the writes aren't that frequent. And that means that basically, um, eventually, uh, the migration will, will end. It will never hang forever. Um, another pro is that it, it's completely safe. We don't risk anything. Um, and another pro is that if the migration is fast enough, we don't throttle the CPU, um, uh, and, and the migration is basically act, uh, acting as a, as a regular pre-copy migration. Um, the cons is that basically we, we uh, slow down the workload. Um, it might be a problem for certain uh, workloads. Um, and if we're taking this approach to the extreme, we get to a point where we uh, completely throttle the CPU, which means this is not um, a really a live migration uh, by all aspects, because um, again, in the extreme, we are almost stopping uh, the workload uh, migrating it and then starting it again. Um, so we have another way to deal with this, which is a post-copy migration. Um, and a post-copy migration basically means that we're, um, uh, as we create a new, the, the target VM, we uh, start, start running on it right away. Um, the idea is that if the VM tries to access a page uh, it does not own, which is basically a page fault. It asks for the source VM to transfer it explicitly. Um, if the target VM does not ask for pages explicitly, which means that uh, it runs on the, the memory blocks it already have, then other pages are being transferred in the background until all the memory is transferred. Um, 
So let's do, look at on, on how it's done. So basically uh, we create another uh, instance at the target node and this instance starts running immediately. Uh, once this, uh, the, the target VM uh, tries to access a memory it does not own, there is a page fault. It asks for the source VM for the specific page that it's lacking and this page is being transferred. Afterwards, when it continues running, um, basically other pages are being transferred in the background. Um, and finally, the, the migration is done. So the pros here is that, again, every page is, is transferred only once because unlike pre-copy migrations, what's happening is that if the, the page is being mutated, uh, we don't care. We don't have to transfer it again because um, it's being mutated at the VM that, that is actually running the workload now. Um, uh, another advantage is, uh, is uh, that the migration always never hangs and uh, we are using less network bandwidth. Um, but we have serious uh, cons here. Uh, the first one is that it's pretty dangerous to do so. Um, that's because we don't have any VM instance that has the full desired state. So for example, what happens if one node crashes? Uh, we can't recover the VM uh, because every VM instance holds only a partial state of the, of the VM. Um, another con is, is a slow warm-up. Um, at first, uh, uh, Basically, when the, the when the target VM just starts running, we will most centrally uh, hit a, a page fault because we don't have any memory. Um, so at the beginning, uh, there will be uh, a lot of page faults, uh, which uh, uh, basically will uh, is a blocking operation. We we will stop the workload because it cannot continue, and um, the, it will wait for the the block to be transferred. And another con is that in general, in the in the average use case, it's it's a slower uh, it's a slower mode, slower migration mode. Um, so basically, I show just one kind of uh, migration configuration, but we have uh, many others, um, like um, the maximum of parallel migrations per node and the maximum uh, migration bandwidth and dedication dedicated migration network. And of course, we will have more configurations in the future. And, um, um, and and basically, um, uh, there is no uh, uh, best configuration for all use cases. Um, so to sum up everything I've just uh, said, so um, uh, with three rules of thumb that are um, uh, not really 100% accurate, but if the VM is running, uh, it is not performing uh, frequent writes to the memory, uh, we might use, we might be, uh, prefer using uh, pre-copy migration, which is the safest and fastest in the average use case. Um, if we are uh, having uh, frequent writes to the memory and we're okay to risk the workload, uh, post-copy uh, sounds great. Um, if we don't want to risk anything, but we're okay with slowing down the, the workload a bit, uh, maybe our converge is, is good. Um, but the main point I'm trying to make here is that uh, tuning migrations configs is not an easy test. Um, there are many considerations and um, it varies uh, significantly between uh, environments. So in order to tune these configurations properly, uh, one needs to understand the priorities of the VMs that are running in the clusters, and uh, what the VMs are doing, what are the exact workloads that are uh, occurring inside these VMs. Um, and what is the environment? Is the network strong? Is, um, uh, is the network fast? So uh, basically to tune all of this, uh, you pretty much have to be an expert. You have to understand the environment. You have to understand the different configurations um, and not everyone can do so. Um, so what, is, what do we have today? And by today, I mean before uh, log migration policy. Uh, so Kubernetes allows to tune migration configs, but uh, only cluster-wide through kubectr. Um, so basically, uh, kubectr, for uh, the ones that don't know, is, uh, is the place when you uh, can have the, the specifications uh, uh, cluster-wide for Kubernetes. So this means that um, you cannot uh, specify different configurations for different VMs. And this is very problematic because the, the configurations, as we just saw, um, are very tied up to the workload that's running inside of the VM. Um, so we need something better. 
Um, so what do we what do we need? What what do we want to have? So on the other hand, we don't want uh, VM creations or VM migrations to be very complicated. So we don't want somebody to uh, in, to uh, consider all of this in order to create a VM or to migrate a VM. Um, and it would be best if somebody, some expert, the system admin or somebody, uh, uh, will basically tune the, the, right, the right configurations. And when someone uh, creates a VM and tries to migrate it, uh, what will happen is that magically the best configuration will be matched uh, to the VM migration. Um, to me specifically, it reminds uh, a bit of uh, security policies like uh, SE Linux. So, for example, if I uh, open up my Fedora and start editing files or creating uh, folders or whatever, uh, I am bound up to uh, certain security policies. I'm not um, aware of them. I don't care about them, but I, I, I am matched to some uh, security policy that somebody uh, that is more expert than me on the matter uh, defined beforehand. So um, we uh, basically we wanted to have the same here. Um, somebody to create them all, and then when some when uh, uh, when somebody else creates the VM, tries to migrate it, the right uh, policy would be matched uh, magically. So these are live migration policies. Um, these policies are matched to a migration uh, on the fly. Um, so the admin would have to define migration policies in advance. And then when migration is requested at the time of the migration, um, it would uh, seek for the most detailed policy and this policy would match uh, the VM. And I'll be talking more on that in a second. Um, and uh, whoever tries to create the VM or migrate it doesn't have to know uh, about these policies and about all these configurations and all the considerations behind them. Um, and another nice thing that I'll be talking about in a minute also is uh, we can make a hierarchy of policies. So a migration policy is matched to a VM um, by uh, VMI or namespace labels. And in order to match, uh, the specified labels have to match all of the specified labels. Um, and again, the most detailed policy, uh, which means basically the policy that requires the most labels has precedence. Um, this allows creating a hierarchy of policies with uh, different priorities, um, of basically uh, priorities that are more confined or have more precedence. Um, if no policy is matched, then uh, we fall back to the kubectr uh, config that would be applied. And if a policy defines only some of the configurations, but not all of them, the value of the, the, the missing configuration would all would be also be taken from the Kubert CR. So we can picture it kind of this way. So we, we can have a development namespace, for example, and a production namespace in our cluster. Uh, maybe we want the max bandwidth of the migrations for the development to be one gigabit, and we want the bandwidth for the production to be unlimited. Um, Maybe under the production, we have backend um, uh, components and frontend uh, components, which should use what, um, um, dedicated network and not use dedicated network. Um, inside of them, we could have um, different um, uh, apps or microservices that would also um, be using different configurations. So um, as you can see, the, the, the nice thing about here is the hierarchy. Um, so the, the VMs, uh, just a VM, a regular VM under production would have unlimited uh, bandwidth, but um, um, a VM under production that is also an engine VM uh, would have post copy. Um, so this is uh, kind of neat. And um, this is how the manifest looks like. We will see the manifest uh, also in the demo, which I'll be uh, showing in a minute. Um, but um, in general, this is how it looks like. Uh, basically, the, the spec um, um, it consisted to two parts. Uh, the first part is a migration configuration, which can be the bandwidth or uh, allow auto converge or uh, anything like that. And the second part is the actual matching to the VMs. And as you can see, uh, we can match the VM by uh, namespace um, labels or by VMI labels. Um, and you will see this uh, again in the demo in a second. 
Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, the most detailed uh, uh, policy has the highest uh, precedence. Uh, this means that uh, it's possible to have more uh, confined policies for more specific scenarios. And the detail level is simply uh, the number of required labels. And again, they all have to be matched. If one label does not match, the policy is not matched. Um, and name, namespace and, uh, and, um, and VMI labels uh, have the same weight. Uh, they're both uh, uh, one uh, considered uh, one uh, detail level. Um, and um, yeah, so um, also uh, another thing that it's important to mention is that the, the matching is always deterministic. Um, so if we have two policies with the same uh, detail level that are matching to the to, to a migration, uh, we simply uh, sort the, the matching migrations by lexicographic order uh, of the name and choose the first one. Uh, this is of course somewhat of an arbitrary uh, decision, but uh, it it does guarantee that, that the matching mechanism is deterministic. So uh, the current state is that live migration policies are implemented and merged and are part of uh, Qvert uh, for um, for the non-release. Um, the API version is uh, still in uh, v1 alpha one, and the current uh, uh, configurations are uh, auto converge, post copy, and migration bandwidth. Um, in the future, of course, more configurations will be supported. Uh, for example, uh, dedicated networks, um, uh, related knobs may appear, and, um, based, and, and perhaps uh, new methods to, uh, to uh, match to VMs. And uh, of course, we will uh, be glad to have more ideas about it from the community. So uh, we're uh, open to new ideas. And uh, now we can start the demo. Okay. So um, these are all the, the folders that I prepared, and uh, now we will uh, walk through them and um, and present. And oh, and another thing is that this is uh, basically what I'm going to do in the demo. So basically, we're going to define some configurations in Qvert CR. We're uh, going to define a production namespace. Uh, with a policy that's uh, supposed to be matched for the, the namespace. Um, and then we'll create a VM. Uh, we, uh, and we will expect that, the, the config, that this configuration from the policy will be matched, and all of the other configurations that are not specified in the policy will be matched from the Kubert TR. Um, after that, uh, there is a, another policy that is that's supposed to match um, um, a DB VM. Um, which is basically, again, uh, more, more detailed than the first policy, we will see that these configurations apply. And again, the ones that are not listed here are uh, applied from the Kubert CR. And just uh, a quick word about uh, this configuration, which I didn't mention, is basically um, the amount of time we have to wait per gigabyte until we're transferring into post copy migration. Um, uh, basically, for the demo purposes, we can just uh, accept it as it is. Um, okay, so let's begin. So first of all, um, we'll post the, the production name, uh, namespace. This is a regular Kubernetes namespace. And as you can see, we have a label that says type production. The name of the namespace is intentionally uh, different to emphasize the fact that uh, the policies aren't being matched to namespaces by names or anything. They're only being matched by labels. Um, okay, so let's post the namespace. And great, and as you can see, the namespace is created. And now I'm just making an ally so it will be easier to not include the minus n uh, uh, argument all the time. So um, k, of course, is kubectl, and kp is kubectl uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with this namespace. So 
So um, now we have to uh, patch kubectr again. So uh, we're going to insert these configurations into kubectr and let's see how it looks like. Okay, so first of all, uh, we're turning on the log migration feature gate. This is just because we want to use log migrations and we have to uh, enable the, the feature gate in order to use them. And um, finally, uh, this is the migration configuration. So first of all, we're um, um, making a pre-copy mode uh, uh, as the configuration here. Um, this is being done by simply turning off uh, auto-conversion post-copy. If they're both turned off, then the default one is, um, is a pre-copy migration. Um, and also, as, uh, as I showed in the presentation, we have an, another two uh, uh, configuration, which is the bandwidth band migration, which is 100 gigabytes, and the completion timer per gigabyte, which is 1.5K. And this patch script just patches it to kubectr, and we're done. OK. OK, so now taking a look at the actual policies. So we have, again, um, a, a policy for the dbvm um, and a policy for the production namespace. So let's have a look. So the production um, uh, policy, Basically, um, as we saw earlier, there are two sections. The first one is the, um, the configuration itself, which is that the bandwidth is uh, 20 gigs, just like shown here. And uh, we're matching it only to a namespace uh, by the type reduction, as we saw earlier, that, uh, um, that, uh, that our namespace has. And this is the second policy. Um, in here, we are align, allowing uh, post copy. The bandwidth is different. And we're uh, matching it by two labels, which means, again, that the, it's more detailed. It has precedence. Uh, so uh, the type is uh, production for the, for the namespace and uh, an app label, uh, an FTB label for the VMI selector. Now we will pulse them, them both into the cluster. And as we can see, they are both uh, uh, posted and created in the cluster. So now we can move on. So we have uh, two more um, directories here, one for the VMIs, so we have Again, the DB VMI and the monitoring VMI, which are, uh, we are going to create now. So um, nothing too interesting. In, nothing too interesting in here. Um, just a second. So basically, the thing that is important is the label part, right? Um, for the monitoring uh, one, is it's not that important because no policy matches to this label. But for the second VM, the DB VM, we have also the app DB, as you saw in, in the policy. Other than that, there are just regular VMs, nothing too important. And now we can see that we I have made two migration jobs. So the, the role of a migration job is basically to perform a migration. The only interesting part is here is the spec, which refers to the uh, VMI name. So again, nothing too interesting here just to show you what's going on. All right, and now we can move to the more, more interesting part. Um, first, we'll create the monitoring VM. So the VM is created. We'll just wait for it to start running. And as you can see, it's running on node one. Now we'll try to migrate it. And soon enough, it will be migrated. All right. 
So as you can see, um, the VM is now in node two, not node one, which means that the migration is, uh, is done. And we can have a look on what uh, configuration actually applied. So let's take a look on the section here. So basically the migration state uh, shows us all of the different configurations that were used. Um, so as we can see, the um, autoconvergence, the post copy are both false as we expected from the Kubernetes CR, which because we wanted to use post copy, uh, pre copy. Sorry. Um, if we will take a look at the completion time or per gigabyte, we didn't um, specify it in the policies anywhere. Therefore, we have it here, right? It, the, the value is being taken from the Kubernetes CR. Um, the, the migration bandwidth on the Kubernetes is 100 gigabytes, but on the match policy, it is um, 20 gigabytes. Um, of course, the policy has precedence. Uh, so um, we can see the 20 gigs here. So everything is expected. And also you can see the migration policy name that was matched. And you can see that this is the policy production, right? This policy. Um, so great, um, everything works as expected. Okay. Now we'll delete the VMI just so um, everything is uh, clearer. And we will create the second VMI, the DB VMI. And again, it's been created. And you can see it's running on node one. Now we'll migrate it. Oh, just forgot the, the P there. Right. And soon enough, it's now migrated to node two. Okay, and again, let's take a look on a VMI. And once again, what we can see here is that basically this um, policy is um, uh, says that it wants um, uh, 30 gigabytes of, of bandwidth. Again, this one has a precedence over everything, over both this policy and the Kubert CR. And as we can see, we do have 30 gigs of uh, bandwidth here. Uh, the one and a half K for the completion time out per gigabyte still uh, is being taken from the Kubernetes CR. And also we allowed post copy here. And as we can see, post copy is allowed. Um, right, so that's it for the demo. And the last part is Q and A. So if somebody has a question. Um, Hi, Edomar. There were a few questions in chat, um, but because the chat will not be part of the recording, please allow me to recap real quickly the discussion that's gone on. Uh, Andre had asked uh, if it's possible to live migrate a, v a VM when using a VGP, or excuse me, a GPU. And the, the general answer there is no, because we cannot copy the memory of the device. Uh, it's not possible to do the, uh, the migration itself. A uh, follow-on question was if the same applied to a vGPU, and Vladek had uh, responded with vGPU is different. In general, it can be migrated, but because but we don't support this right now because there is no official support for this in QMU. Some vendors, such as AMD, do support SROV GPU virtualization migration, but we don't have the hardware to even try it at this point. Andre did ask a question in the middle of that, and that was perhaps we should use the MISA drivers instead of the hardware GPU drivers, then we could get the memory access to do the live migration. And is anybody working in that direction? As far as I know, no. Uh, uh, is that what you think, Edomar? I'm not aware of anybody working towards that. Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was trying to read the question. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Sorry. The, the, the question was, perhaps if we use the MISA drivers instead of the hardware GPU drivers, then we could get memory access to do the live migration. If, is anybody working in that direction? Um, actually, I can't answer this question. I'm sorry. But um, 
you can always uh, email me and I will uh, try to look it up. All right, so then we, uh, Prasanth asked a question, can migration policies be used to pick certain VMs over others during node drain? I'm not sure what you mean by that because in a drain we're um, uh, basically moving all of the VMs out of the node. Um, but uh, maybe maybe um, the question is uh, which VMs to, to drain first. Um, but either way, uh, we don't support it right now. Um, but again, this this uh, this feature is in very early stages, so uh, we'll be happy to to have uh, uh, new ideas from the community. So you're more than welcome to uh, participate in this. There's a request that you uh, stop sharing your screen. And Chris Caligari asked, can't NVIDIA GPUs share memory via InfiniBand? Um, again, I can't answer this question, but... Uh... <laughs> But uh, you can uh, any any questions uh, you can email me and uh, I will uh, respond. I will post my email in the in the chat. Uh, I will give it just a minute to see if anybody's still typing or asking a question. Uh, we still have uh, twenty minutes until the next presentation is scheduled to start, so plenty of time. As Josh pointed out, if anybody would like to ask a question aloud, we can turn on your uh, your microphone and camera and allow you to do that. Okay, it looks like we've got no more takers in terms of questions. Uh, so with that, uh, we can go ahead and uh, stop this presentation and the next one will be scheduled to start at 1635 UTC.